let's go ahead and get started. And good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for our Investor Confidence Forum. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Cindy Fernelli, the Executive Director of the Center for Audit Quality. The CAQ is an autonomous public policy organization dedicating to enhancing investor confidence and public trust in global capital markets, and we focus on public company auditing and corporate governance issues. Since our inception in 2007, just before the onset of the economic crisis, the CAQ has commissioned the Glover Park Group to conduct an annual survey of the investing public on four key questions about the capital markets what we call our Investor Confidence or Main Street Investor Survey. We also ask those investors some questions about current economic and policy issues that may be on their radar. The survey targets individual investors only. So to qualify for the survey, an individual must have at least $10,000 invested in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, or self-directed IRA or 401k retirement accounts. The Glover Park Group polls via phone 1,000 investors in order to secure a margin of error of plus or minus three percentage points. To the best of our knowledge, there are no other surveys that focus so completely on individual investor confidence in the capital markets, even though investors, individual investors, play a major role in the success of our markets. We also believe our survey has provided unique value in tracking investor sentiment through the financial crisis, the recession, and now a slow but steady recovery. This year we did something even more unique. We supplemented our traditional survey results with a pulse survey of over 400 investors to gain fresh insights into exactly how the federal government shutdown and the looming debt crisis are impacting investor confidence. I'm pleased to share with you this morning what we've found. The four key confidence questions that we ask year over year are, number one, how much confidence do you have in U.S. capital markets? Number two, how much confidence do you have in capital markets outside of the United States? Number three, how much confidence do you have investing in U.S. companies that are publicly traded? And number four, how much confidence do you have as an investor in audited financial information released by publicly traded U.S. companies? The theme for this year's forum is Inside the Mind of Investors, which reflects the fact that we've added some questions to get an idea about what make investors tick. Who do they listen to for investing advice? And what factors determine where they invest their money? We hope to dive into that topic with our panel today. I'm going to give you a brief summary of the findings, which you have in all of your materials, then we'll turn to the panel. I'm really looking forward to this discussion because I believe these survey results can do more than simply inform us as to investors' views and confidence. I think the numbers also can serve as a springboard for a broader conversation about our economy and our markets. It's been interesting to track investor confidence since the financial crisis. Cutting to the chase, in 2007, when we started the survey, investor confidence in U.S. capital markets clocked in at 84%. At its worst, confidence fell to a low of 61% in 2011, perhaps because the economic recovery lagged behind expectations. This year, just prior to the government shutdown, confidence reached its highest level since 2009 at 69%. While this is still 15 percentage points below the pre-confidence measure, the pre-crisis confidence measure of 84%, it still is good, but it does make me wonder if we have reached a new normal. Will we ever get back to such high confidence levels as we saw in 2007? The most frequent reasons investors gave for having confidence is the economic news they hear at 43%, and their trust in the government in general, or the president specifically, at 22%. But we also asked those who did not have confidence in U.S. capital markets why they lacked confidence. Investors cited too much government spending or interference at 30%, the state of the economy in general at 26%, and too little government oversight of the financial markets at 
It's very interesting to see the government cited by investors both as a source of confidence and as a factor that reduces their confidence. So I'm interested to see if our panel wants to address this apparent paradox. With respect to confidence in capital markets outside of the United States, confidence rebounded slightly from 35% in 2012 to 42% this year, which does mark a significantly statistical change. The next two questions are especially significant to the Center for Audit Quality because of who we are and what we do. The first is confidence in investing in U.S. publicly traded companies. I think the results are remarkable. Confidence peaked just prior to the shutdown, reaching the highest level ever at 79%, rising eight percentage points from last year. With respect to confidence in audited financial statements released by public companies, confidence has held steady at around 72%. I think these results demonstrate a deeply ingrained trust in the information public companies put forth. I would further posit that, that this confidence is underpinned in large part because the financial statements are audited by independent external auditors, demonstrating a sense of trust in and reliance on the audit profession. In fact, for the past two years, we've asked respondents who they think are most effective in looking out for investors' interests. In both years, investors expressed the most confidence in independent auditors, followed by financial advisors and brokers, and then third, independent audit committees. As I mentioned at the outset of my remarks, the CAQ went back into the field following the government shutdown to gain a fresh perspective on the impact the events in Washington are having on investor confidence. Frankly, we wanted to explore whether this clear trend of it rising investor confidence could weather a shutdown, and what impact a prolonged shutdown or potential U.S. default would have on market confidence. The results from a poll of 424 investors fielded from October 3rd to October 6th show several interesting things. First, that investor confidence in U.S capital markets today, post-shutdown, remain steady at 69%. However, the longer the shutdown goes on, the more confidence will erode. If it lasts just another week, confidence recedes to 60%. And most importantly, investor confidence would plummet to a record low of 39% if Congress failed to raise the debt ceiling and the U.S. were to default on its financial obligations. This new data shows just how high the stakes are for the country and our capital markets if the U.S. defaults. To put this into perspective, we've not seen investor confidence in U.S. capital markets fall below 60% in the seven years that we've conducted our survey, including in 2008 at the height of the financial crisis. So it's clear that the consequences of a default are real and significant for investors. Now let me highlight the results of the topical questions we asked this year, mostly about the economy. 75% of investors expressed confidence that the economic environment would either stay the same or improve, while only 23% believe the American economic situation is likely to decline over the next year. 27% of investors expect their personal financial situation to improve, while 62% expected to say the same over the next year. The four top economic concerns investors have are in order. Number one, not having enough money for retirement. Number two, not being able to afford health care if seriously ill or injured. Number three, not being able to maintain their current standard of living and number four, fear of losing their jobs. Now a peek inside the minds of the investors. We asked them how essential various pieces of information were to their decision-making process when looking to invest in a publicly traded company. Here is what we found. 44% said the sector or industry in which the economy operates is essential. About the same percentage said whether a company has sound corporate governance in place is essential. And 40% said whether a company behaves in a socially responsible, environmentally friendly way is essential. At the end of the list, while CEO compensation has been a popular topic in recent years, 
only 16% of investors call it an essential factor in their decision-making process. 76% of investors say CEO pay plays no role in their decision-making. Here today on our panel, we have some social media enthusiasts. So I wanted to highlight one more survey result. We asked investors who they rely on for investment advice and information. A large majority, 73%, turn to financial planners or analysts, at least some of the time. In second place is information in financial reports, followed by newspapers and periodicals, family, friends, and colleagues, financial experts, and finally, social media, which clocks in at 34%. While this falls below the other sources of information, I think this is nonetheless an interesting finding. Since this is the first year we asked this question, we don't have historical data like we do on some of the other topics. But I suspect that if we had done this three years ago, the numbers would have been even lower. So this is clearly an area to watch given recent developments, including the SEC decision on using social media to communicate financial information and the Twitter IPO. We'll continue to track this question going forward to see any changes in behavior over the coming years. So now it's time for our panel to have at it. I'm looking forward to their reactions to the survey, and I want to thank Ben White, Politico's chief and economic correspondent and virtual host of Morning Money for moderating our discussion today, and also to our panelists for their willingness to take on the tough questions this morning. But before I turn this over to Ben, I want to show you a brief video of interviews we had with individuals who were actually out on the street. These interviews were conducted about two weeks ago in and around Washington, and it's amazing how consistent their responses are to the survey responses. So let's watch. I think it's a volatile market. Investing is always a good thing. It runs our futures and has controlled our past. But you know, when you're just the average type Joe on the streets, I think it's a risky proposition if you don't know what you're looking at. I mean, the financial crisis is definitely over, and the Eurozone crisis is in the end. So people might think that they probably should do some investment right now. The most important thing would be um, high returns with the social conscience. I think that my number one consideration would be their financial performance, but I wouldn't invest in anything that I didn't believe in. So if I felt that they were, you know, abusing their people or being a poor steward of our environment, I don't, I wouldn't, I'd move on. Everything that uh, a company does is very important, including what's on the balance sheet. You know, for an investor, the company has to make money. I'm just a novice, so I would rely on good. My brother's a great investor. I rely on him. My son-in-law's a doctor. He has great investments. I rely on him. <laughs> so I'm re ready to take that next step, um, you know, in, into a greater investment, into a more unsecure portfolio. Primarily from sources that are produced by the federal government. Also, um, a few different uh, reporting agencies that are available online. Um, some independent magazines, like Money Magazine. Um, but I ultimately defer to the advice of a financial advisor. Reading up on the companies, uh, the company's um, uh, reports, and also the financial institutions have websites that I read up on the companies so I decide whether or not I want to invest in them. And I also have advisors that can give me a tip on what's good and what's not good. You have to look at the different levels of um, investors. Some, are, some people would consider themselves sophisticated investors, and some people want to get into the, into the game. I think that the, what social media does, it brings a lot more people into the game. Social media, I think it brings more people in. It'll drive the market up. I, I actually like it because if I pick a good stock and more people are piling money on, the price is only going to go up. Today's generation is, is more thought, thoughtful about their future than when I was coming up. Um, I, don't, I don't think that the, the information process was 
was as fluid as it is when we were coming up. It was, you had to go and, and do the hardcore research in order to know. But I think with the advent of the, you know, information age and the internet, that has just made it incredibly easy for even children to do. All right, well, that's the end of our uh, video. Some interesting commentary from uh, men and women on the street. Uh, as uh, I'm Ben White from Politico, write the Morning Money column, and uh, somewhat of a social media enthusiast uh, myself. <laughs> Uh, when I introduce the panel, we've got Andy Cross from The Motley Fool, who uh, I guess you guys don't wear the, the hats and all that stuff anymore. That's we do. Right. No, we do. We do. I just didn't bring mine. You didn't sorry. bring mine. Okay, that's sorry. okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm disappointed. That's you. quite all right. David Cass is a finance professor at the Robert S. H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. Thanks for being here. And Alice Korngold, president of Korngold Consulting. Uh, thanks to the panel. These are really interesting survey results, uh, particularly the Pulse survey. Uh, giving us a sense for how confidence would be basically destroyed by a debt ceiling, uh, a failure to raise the debt ceiling. Um, and, you know, I, I guess we'd start with that. Uh, what struck you the most about that Pulse survey? Uh, and it seems like there's been already been a drop from the 79% to 69% in confidence in the markets based on the shutdown, but obviously the debt ceiling would be a much bigger problem for investors. Uh, we start at the end and maybe move down. Well, the thing that surprised me the most, Ben, was that um, investors seem to make a distinction between the shutdown and the debt ceiling crisis. And so um, I'm, I'm pleased by that, but I'm surprised that they cut it that finely. Yeah. Um, Andy, you deal with the individual investor yep. all the time. Um, do you have insights for us into, uh, I mean, it, this interesting split between people trusting government information and also uh, it's their largest concern uh, for the markets and for their own investments that uh, our government is not functioning uh, properly. Uh, what do you think the react would be to a, a debt limit breach? And did the 39% number uh, surprise you, uh, the extent to which it would sort of fall off a cliff if we didn't raise a debt limit? Well, I don't think it, uh, I wrote that down too, and Cindy said that both a source and a challenge of confidence government is. I think that's true. I think, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm actually not surprised by that, by that, by that drop. I think people, fundamentally understand the concept of not paying your bills and versus the government shutting down. We've been through more than 70 government shutdowns here over the years. So I think conceptually they understand that. But fundamentally, the idea of not paying your bills or having to prioritize your bill paying is very scary for most people. And so they would react to that. And I think certainly as we get closer to the October 17th deadline, we'll see the market start to react in ways that will hopefully start to shake up a little bit of uh, the uh, halls of Washington here. Right, and David, you and I were talking about this beforehand, that that's already happening to a degree. The, the markets are reacting now. You see it in uh, short-term treasuries. You see it in the volatility index. Um, what is your view to the extent to which markets are reacting now and, and what they're likely to do as we get yes. closer? Yes, um, as of this morning, there was a news piece uh, that I observed that short-term treasury bills uh, just in the last couple of days, the last week since uh, the crisis has hit or the impasse has uh, been reached, uh, the short-term treasury bills have gone up uh, in yield from virtually zero. They still are historically low rates, of something like 0.03% for a three-month bill up to 0 0.3. That's uh, a factor of about 10. Historically, these rates are much higher. Uh, but there is this movement up in the past day, it's doubled. And basically the concern here is those who lend money to the government, purchase treasury bills, expect to be paid back in full in say three months if it's a three month bill. And treasury bills roll over every Thursday. And the way these are purchased, the way they function, an investor for example may uh, uh, invest $950 and expect to receive back $1,000 at the end of the time period of three months, and that we, let's say, 2% yield. Uh, and if there is some concern that just when the Treasury bills are due to be paid, if there is a breach, we go over the debt ceiling, it is not increased, will this investor or these investors be paid back on time? So we can already see this in the volatility measures in the Treasury bill market. Uh, investors are starting to certainly show their anxiety. 
Uh, and I think this is certainly being communicated to the public in general, as shown by the sharp drop uh, in the confidence measures and what would happen if this lasted another week or longer. Yeah. Alice, you deal with uh, corporations, the biggest corporations all the time, and you're consulting work, uh, you know, to what extent do you get a sense from them uh, that there is a belief that the debt limit breach is a real plausible scenario that would be damaging to all of their businesses, or is there a sense that, uh, once again, we're going to get a deal, at least perhaps a short-term deal and then a longer-term deal? Uh, is there a uh, change at all in the attitudes of top corporate leaders on the likelihood of a, of a debt default? And if that happens, what does it mean for them? Well, I think there's concern, and I think in the bigger picture and the longer term that people lose confidence in government in terms of solving global problems, and it's providing, I think this leads to the issue of ESG, which is one of the topics of today, envir environment, social, and governance, and I think it provides an opportunity and an expectation on the part of investors and the public at large, consumers, employees, and the public at large, for companies to solve global problems. Um, and with Doha and Rio Plus and many other issues facing the world, climate change, ecosystems, poverty, education, healthcare, I think people are looking more and more to corporations that are driven by markets to solve global problems where governments have not been able to do so. And here again, frustration at, um, at government. So it just reinforces people's lack of confidence. Yeah, and uh, speaking of some of those uh, other factors, uh, Cindy, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, findings in the survey that suggested a lot of investors consider more non-financial factors as being essential to their investment decisions than financial factors. Talk to me a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, we, we thought that was an interesting finding, too, that I, I think to pick up on Alice's point, that more and more people are looking outside of just the numbers, if you will. And I think the survey results showed that the numbers are important because there's still high confidence in audited financial statements. But that outside of the numbers, they're looking more and more to these other things, like uh, the, the company's governance structure. Uh, we've heard a lot about that. That's something we care about a lot and then the environmentally and socially conscious um, investing, too, or the, the, the company's profile in that space. Mm -hmm. um, Andy, how much do you see uh, investors now paying close attention to those things, the sort of the social responsibility factors, environmental, uh, all of the stuff that goes beyond the bottom line uh, in terms of you know, how investors decide what companies to invest in? I think a ton, Ben. I think, <clears throat> I think all the factors that Alice uh, had, had discussed, uh, as well as just the markets they're serving, the customers they're trying to react, attract, um, what is their mission? I mean, we're big believers in The Motley Fool of, of finding companies that have great missions and great cor corporate cultures because studies show that companies with great co corporate cultures financially perform better and outperform their peers in the public market. So all these factors and the beauty with investing today is that we have access and exposure to so much more information than we ever had before. We just never had access to this 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I started investing, literally you were begging companies when you were calling them up, begging them to get on a conference call and they wouldn't let you. Because they're like, oh no, it's only for professional investors and analysts. Mm -hmm. Well now that's been totally disrupted by the, by the internet. And I think you see that in the investor um, attitudes towards understanding the information. Financially audited statements, supremely important, but there's so much more information out there that investors can find and those factors definitely go into the, the decisions they make. Yeah, and, and Alice, how good are companies getting at providing that kind of information beyond the audited financial statement uh, about their you know, sort of social responsibility, their environmental impact? Um, I mean, do they, is enough information being provided? Is the quality of that information high enough for investors to make good judgments on uh, how companies are behaving? So according to the Governance and Accounting Institute, um, between 2011 and 2012, uh, among the 14, uh, Fortune 500 companies, there was an increase from 20% to 57% of companies reporting on ESG factors. And this is using GRI and SASB, you know, very, um, very high standards of reporting. So, uh, and many companies are providing sustainability reports. And Bloomberg tracks and reports for anyone. 
um, on all of the companies. So, it, so companies know that this matters to people, and they're increasingly providing this information. And what's really important about this information, I notice in the um, CAQ study, uh, investors are saying that sound corporate governance matters, um, companies' key strengths and weaknesses, strategy for future growth, outlook for industry risks and opportunities, as well as acting socially and environmentally responsibly. Well, the reason these factors are all, the reason the ESG information is so important is it tells you if a company is looking out to the future at climate change, at ecosystems, at human rights, at education and healthcare. Education and healthcare, of course, being completely relevant to the future workforce and productivity, and climate change and ecosystems being completely relevant to the company's opportunity to um, access the resources it needs to produce, manufacture what it needs. Um, it, it means a company's looking forward in terms of the three billion new consumers in the next couple of decades that will be uh, available in emerging markets. So companies that are looking aware of this and are saying, what does this mean to us in terms of risks? And what does this mean to us in terms of opportunities? And how do we use our expertise and our resources to take advantage of this? So investors, consumers, employees are smart. They're saying a company that's factoring these things in and taking advantage, and it's a few leading companies that are doing this, that are saying, how do we use our technology to capture our opportunities? Those are the companies that will win in the global marketplace. The companies that have boards made up of people from diverse backgrounds, diverse nationalities, that can really be imagine the greater potential and capture these opportunities. People are smart about that, and they understand these are the companies I want to invest in. And social media makes this information available to us. And could you give us a couple of examples of those companies that are doing it uh, particularly well? In your um, Unilever, Nike, um, these are companies that are really factoring in um, uh, climate change ecosystems uh, into uh, uh, looking at reducing their carbon footprint, looking at their uh, limiting their use of natural resources. Um, and Nike is uh, working together with other companies and NASA to uh, uh, look uh, to source the uh, development of new materials for its footwear and apparel so that they're looking for their own good at being more sustainable as a company uh, for the long term, as well as what consumers and employees care about. So that's long-term value for the company. You know, Ben, I see an interesting tipping point or balance point here because I think, to Alice's point, uh, many global companies are giving more disclosure than paying more attention to these type of non-financial disclosures out there. And yet, if you talk to the investors in our survey, um, they don't have as much confidence in the non-US markets as they do in the US markets. And so while I think that you're gonna find these socially responsible, the ESG types of disclosures and how companies comport themselves more and more important to investors, I wonder what that means about their confidence in non-US markets. Um, now, there are of course other factors as to why they might not have confidence in the non-US factors, but I mean in the non-US companies. But I wonder if companies become more uh, socially responsible, if that will raise the confidence of our non-US markets. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, Cindy, were you surprised by the number on social media and the extent to which investors get their information uh, from social media? It seemed relatively high to me, although as you mentioned, we don't have a baseline for comparing it, but it was 30 something percent. 34, I think, Which, yeah. uh, I, I don't know, I mean, maybe that's a good thing that, you know, 34 percent of people are making investments decisions based on tweets, but it seems to me that that <laughs> might be a slightly uh, dangerous thing to do. I mean, Cindy, you could uh, jump on that, but uh, also, Andy, this is right in your wheelhouse. Uh, do you think investors are basing their decisions off of either corporate tweets or, I guess, more likely sort of what their peers are, are tweeting about, uh, you know, and what company's hot and what's not hot? Uh, David or Andy, well, David, you jump Well, uh, certainly there's the well-known Carl Icahn tweet yeah. from a month ago 
uh, Carl Icahn um, spoke to Tim Cook over the telephone at Apple uh, requesting a large stock buyback. Uh, this becomes known. He tweets this, one or two tweets, and all of a sudden Apple stock jumps 10, 20, 30, 40 points very quickly as this spreads throughout the community. Uh, so I think certainly uh, certain individual uh, individuals on Twitter are being followed closely, and if they're highly regarded and considered a very good source of investment information, I think uh, investors will um, follow them. Uh, so I think this is actually a growing area, and it could indeed affect the stock prices of many companies, and Apple is just one example. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, your thoughts on that, Andy? Yeah, absolutely, Ben. I think um, <clears throat> it's, it's super exciting. It's also a little unnerving because there's very little accountability. Um, and when you were taking advice, everyone has advice. Everyone in this room can tell me their favorite stock, their favorite company, their favorite industry, so on and so forth. Um, but when there's no accountability and you don't know if that person is a good track record, has a good public facing track record, is any good at what advice they're giving. So one thing we've done at The Motley Fool was really try to add more transparency. So everyone in this room can participate in our community and talk about your companies you like or don't like by a thumbs up or thumbs down, but then we have a track record of that. So we know. So when you're on Twitter and you're taking advice from Andy Cross, you can go to The Motley Fool and you can see my track record. Is he any good at picking stocks? The answer is yes. <laughs> uh, but hey, it's, um, How so good is I, Andy Cross I at think, picking stocks? Yeah. Uh, so I think that's very important because there's just like it's been since the internet basically evolved, when I first came to The Motley Fool when I left my investment firm, my boss was like, oh, those chat rooms, I just don't, you know, who knows what's going on, I don't trust it. And back then that was fairly true, but now there's been so much more progress in transparency and understanding from whom you're getting your advice, and is that advice any good or not? And I think that is really where the excitement comes, because as you in increase that transparency, that's good for the public markets, and that's good for investors to embrace it's just that not everyone is doing it. So right. we encourage everyone to open the transparency and making sure that you know from whom you're getting your advice. Because if not, you could be at risk of getting advice from people who are just interested in pumping up penny stocks, for example. And that can be very detrimental to an investor's portfolio if they're not, uh, not careful. Yeah. Uh, Alice, how are companies dealing with this uh, sort of uh, newfound interest in getting information off of social media? Twitter, Facebook, wherever else. Um, obviously, it's a, both a risk and an opportunity yeah. for, uh, for them to engage in a different way. Yeah, I, I think it's a very powerful tool. And I, thir I think the 34% is really interesting. But beyond that, I think social media has become part of the whole fabric ecosystem of business. So it's, it's also part of how companies engage with consumers. So it's also going to show up in the value of a company. For instance, um, Walmart apparently has the most, um, the CMO just gave a talk recently, and um, apparently they have the largest following of all companies, and they actually understand how to engage with their consumers. They have 30 million Facebook followers and 350,000 Twitter followers, and they not only talk at them, but they engage with them. And he says the ROI has been the, big, the best investment they've ever made in terms of marketing that has been very powerful for them. Um, a Harvard Business Review study said that I think it's 79% of companies either have or plan to have a social media, the majority of them have a social media presence, the rest are launching one, but that only half understand how to really engage with them. A study by um, Brand Fog so that um, that people trust the CEO, the C-suite, employees and consumers trust the heads of companies who have a presence on social media. And actually that company works with C-suite people to help them create an online presence. Um, and it, it, to, to your point, Andy, I mean, that's really interesting um, that you make recommendations, but you try to show transparency so people can evaluate you and assess you, and I, I think People, I think social media provides an opportunity for leaders to show who they are, to engage with stakeholders, to
to say this is what our company represents in terms of values, who we are, what we stand for, and to engage with the public so that you can assess and decide what does this company mean, do I trust them, do I like what they say. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in times of crisis, um, people said also in that study that um, they trust a company more in times of crisis when they can see who the leadership is and what they stand so for. So you're saying that CEOs themselves should be tweeting about exactly. companies. Exactly, according to this study. Um, yeah. They're they can get themselves in trouble doing that. Well, that is imagine. a very interesting question, Ben, is, and, and this gets into the factor towards um, public disclosure, how much and what can a CEO or what kind of company say, and where do they start to cross lines that maybe have been set by the SEC or other regulatory bodies. So it is, again, we're in this, this space that's developing so fast, and to me it seems like corporations are typically far ahead of the government when it comes to understanding the regulatory concerns of this and pushing the envelope and that the government and that the regulatory bodies are often playing catch up mm. to what's happening out in the marketplace. Yeah. And we're starting to see that with some of the social yeah. media too. Well, given, I, I'm sorry, I was gonna say, given your, your data that uh, people trust CEOs who are on uh, social media, mm -hmm. perhaps our policymakers should get on social media right. uh, to boost the confidence mm. if we go into a tech crisis. Some of them <laughs> are on social media. It doesn't seem to do a whole lot to, to boost confidence <laughs> because what they say on social media is about the same that they say in their public <laughs> remarks, which is, we're not going to talk to you. We're not going to make a deal. We're not going to do right. uh, any of those things. Um, did you want to jump in? I there? was just going to say, interesting, and I don't know this, but I and I don't know if those CEOs are actually the real CEOs right. or are they like their handler. I mean, I think it they're is very handlers. interesting again yeah. to start to think about who is actually out there putting out this right. information. In terms of so. politicians, I mean, you know, tweets come out from Speaker Boehner, they come out from uh, Majority Leader Cantor and others, and I can tell you uh, most of the time they're not the actual yeah. person uh, yeah. doing those tweets. You have a uh, oh, Thank a you for inviting oh. I mean, I'm not saying it's never the case, but it's generally speaking, uh, somebody deals with that for them. And we've seen from other politicians, it's generally probably a good idea to pass that responsibility off to somebody else. Um, David, I want to go back to the survey results uh, in a minute, but we were talking uh, at breakfast about Janet Yellen, and you had some very interesting comments about uh, her. As everyone knows, the president's going to appoint, or not appoint, but nominate Janet Yellen as the next Fed chair this afternoon. Uh, more than likely, she gets confirmed, although it's not a guarantee. Uh, you know a little bit about her personally. Uh, tell us about your experience uh, with Janet Yellen. Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's an excellent selection. Uh, as the next Federal Reserve Chair. Uh, Janet Yellen's first year uh, teaching at Harvard, which uh, I give away my age, uh, spring of 1973, was my first year as a graduate student. Uh, and she was my uh, instructor, my professor that semester. Uh, we were all about the same age at that time. And after classes, we would quite frequently go into the cafeteria at the school and with a few students and Janet uh, over a cup of coffee, discuss economics and other issues. And I got to know her very well then. She's just a really very fine, warm, open, honest person. And then years later in 1994, uh, when she first came to Washington to be a governor on, uh, under an Alan Greenspan uh, chairmanship at the Federal Reserve, uh, I was then working in the government, uh, not yet at the University of Maryland, and I had just sent her a letter uh, wishing her well in a new position, telling her where I was, uh, put it in the mail, and then uh, the following week, I received a phone call from uh, Janet Yellen's secretary at the Board of Governors uh, saying that uh, Governor Yellen would like to have lunch with me one day next week. Um, which day is best for you? And I was just amazed. <laughs> and, and anyway, I did accept, and I had a private lunch with uh, Governor Yellen for a couple hours in, in a private uh, meeting room uh, at the Federal Reserve, catching up on things. And I've certainly followed her over the years. She is highly regarded, highly regarded in her profession. I think she's a very effective leader. I think she's the first woman head of a uh, central bank. Um, and I expect her to be extremely successful. And in terms of banking experience at the Federal Reserve, I think she has more experience than any previous Federal Reserve Board Chairman. Um, so I expect her to do extremely well, and especially at this time, 
if I might say a couple of words, our monetary policy versus fiscal there's, there's policy. There's nothing more exciting to me than monetary policy. <laughs> so I'm sure. And I say that quite honestly. I'm and sorry. this blends in with the uh, debt ceiling impasse that we have right now. Uh, the Federal Reserve, as we all know, is uh, continuing its purchases of $85 billion a month uh, in long-term government bonds, mortgage-backed securities. And, uh, and Janet Yellen is now the vice chair on the Federal Reserve, working very closely with Chairman Bernanke. And it's very likely that she will continue this policy in the foreseeable future. Uh, but what is going on here from a broad economics point of view, uh, the Federal Reserve, and perhaps one reason they chose not to taper at the last meeting, was anticipating the very impasse that we have now, that they're using monetary policy to try to stimulate the economy, try to get the economy back to where it was, or at least on a normal growth path before the financial crisis, knowing full well that our fiscal policy is likely to become more restrictive, that there is a fiscal drag. The sequester itself uh, is slowing down government spending and a likely compromise, perhaps in next year's budget or compromise solution in the current situation uh, may very well be a further cut in federal government spending, which would be a fiscal drag slowing down the economy. So the stimulative policy from the Fed is actually helping to offset that to some extent. And I think uh, Janet Yellen is sort of the ideal person in that position right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of uh, the economy and people's views on the economy, Cindy, the, um, the survey results seem to indicate that people have general confidence in the broader economy, less so in their own personal uh, prospects for uh, improvements in, in the coming year. Um, how do you sort of explain that uh, divergence between uh, or did it strike you that there's a divergence between how people view uh, the broader economy and their own personal situation? What does that mean? Yeah, I, I think that they do have broader confidence uh, or com more confidence in the broader economy and less so in their own personal. And I don't know if that's um, a, a dichotomy between the haves and the have-nots, um, because recall that these are man-on-the-street investors, mm -hmm. if you will, um, and they, they roughly split out about 50-50 about 50% have more than $100,000 invested and about 50% have less than $100,000 invested. Uh, so you do have a wide swath of economic people, uh, economic positions answering these questions. But um, I, I think they, they feel the pinch still. Um, I'm always shocked whenever I walk down the streets of Washington, D.C., or I was just in New York yesterday, the number of shop fronts that are closed down and they seem to be increasing. And so that, to me, is an indication that people are still feeling that pinch on a real day-to-day -day basis, because these are usually mom-and-pop right. type stores that are going out of business. Right. Yeah, one thing, Ben, I think I heard this right, Cindy, that you said, so the fears when people look at their financial situation, retirement, number one, health care, number two, maintaining standard of living, number three, and fear of losing job, number, number four. four right. I, th I would have thought fear of losing jobs would have been higher. Number mm. one, yeah. I mean, retire, we, we see this in our community from members, but they're act, maybe it's because they're actively re investing. What are you investing for? What are you hoping to achieve? And a lot of that is I want to retire comfortably. I want to be able to live my life if I'm not retired currently or standard of living if I am retired. Mm -hmm. But losing a job, given, given the importance of steady income into investing, um, I just would have thought that would have been higher. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's because, and again, I'm speculating here, but I wonder if it's because, um, you know, you hear more and more in the press that people are having to delay their retirement. Um, they had to dip into their savings to get through the financial crisis, and so they probably have uh, fewer savings on which to rely. And so I, I wonder if that's what's driving their fear of not having enough money to retire. Yeah. Yeah. David, do you have uh, thoughts on that? It looked like you wanted to pipe in on the uh, yeah. idea. Yeah, yeah. No, I um, agree with Andy's point that, again, I think all the points above it, retirement, health care, standard of living, that finished higher, um, are not surprising. But again, uh, with respect to fear, perhaps of losing your job, perhaps uh, the recent improvement, gradual improvement in the economy, uh, reducing the reduction in the unemployment rate from close to 10% down to about 7.3% right now. 
Uh, there's a reduction, in, perhaps until now, with the government impasse, uh, less fear of losing jobs, and there's greater hiring going on as the economy, <coughs> hopefully, uh, sometime in the near future, gets back on a normal growth path. Right, although we are in danger of uh, losing a lot of that confidence in the, in the yep. immediate future, obviously. Yep. Um, let's talk about, uh, for a moment, about one of the more traditional pieces of information, the audited financial statement. Uh, findings show that confidence in audited financial information is strong, went up slightly. Uh, also saw two-thirds of investors consider this information when making their investment decision-making process, and one in four say it's essential to their decision-making process. Um, I guess, uh, Kathy, we'll start with you. Uh, Cindy, we'll start with you. What does this say to you about the relationship between the public company audit and investor confidence? Yeah, I think you couple those statistics that you just gave us as well as that the um, independent auditor comes in first place and the, the people that they trust to look after their interests. Um, I, I think it shows that that is a fundamental core uh, process in our economic uh, and, and market capital structure and that people do rely on that. I think it's a fundamental, it's a, um, a, a base that they come to expect and so then you can add on these other things uh, such as the environmental, uh, what the, the, the CEOs pay, that's not as important as we had thought it was gonna be. Um, but those other factors, those non-economic factors. So I think that that's the base that people start their investing on uh, and make their decisions on, but that there are additives that they want as well. Yeah, Alice, did you have thoughts on that? And particularly, I was also struck by the relatively low level that CEO pay came in as a uh, factor in people's investment uh, decision making. I mean, I've spent years writing about CEO pay and uh, how out of control it had gotten and now it slightly you know, more tied to performance, that sort of thing. But um, obviously the audit financial statement is still the, the bedrock. Um, what other factors do you see as uh, you know, critical? And did it surprise you that the, the pay figure was not higher in people's minds on how they decide where to invest? It, it did surprise me. In, in the Twitterverse among corporate governance people, CEO pay is, is wildly uh, discussed and, yeah. and uh, written about and uh, a lot of energy and excitement. So it was really interesting that that's not of great concern. I'm not quite sure what that means. I'd be curious to hear what others I mean, I guess that. it's just as long as a company is performing well and investors are making money, they don't care that much what the boss is making. Um, although, presumably, they care if the boss is making a whole lot and they're not getting a good return on their I investment. Get, that's an interesting question, Ben. I mean, <clears throat> as long as that could be the case, and that could maybe explain a little bit of it, but um, alignment is a big one, too, I think. And is, is the CEO and are the top executives aligned? And is, is that pay structure aligned? Is it transparent? Is it understood? Is it clear? Does it not change? I mean, all those factors go into understanding a, a, a CEO executive. I was surprised by the by the lower level of um, the, the low ranking of that, just because it is such a such a kind of a, a hotbed, a hot topic in just the press and in conversation, and just even even when you look at board structure and board compensation and and uh, and and um, uh, the factors that go into an investment, uh, at least that we consider as well, too. Um, but I will say, it, if some of the some CEOs that are paid very well, and if it's clear and understood from the investor perspective, and if they have performed and met the expectations that set, if the pays align, that that can be okay. Right. That can be okay. Um, the, the the problems I have is when it's not. And yeah. it's not clear and it's not understood. Yeah. I want to open it up to audience questions in a minute, but I'm interested in David's thoughts on, on that uh, topic. Yeah, um, relating again to what Andy just said, one measure that I like to use uh, before making my own individual investments um, is to do my own calculation of the market value of stock in the company the CEO owns, forming a ratio of that value to his annual, his or her annual salary. The higher the ratio, the more the CEO's interests are aligned with shareholders. And quite often I've come across, I remember many years ago, uh, I'll go back to 1969, uh, there was a company called Scientific Resources and there was a preferred stock and I didn't know that much about the stock markets back then that was paying a very high dividend 
and I received a proxy statement, and I was stunned uh, that none of the senior managers owned any of the stock, and the company subsequently failed shortly thereafter. So I certainly, I, I look at their ownership in the stock of the company as a ratio to their salary as mm -hmm. being very important, higher than other competitors. And you find, Andy, that uh, investors at the pool talk about alignment between uh, executive pay and, or, you know, alignment between CEO interests and shareholder interests. I mean, is it a topic that gets a lot of traction on the board? I would say it's, it's, it's one of the highest. Yeah. I mean, having, having a, uh, an executive team and a board that's, that's aligned with the shareholders and with the stakeholders, too. And so it's not just shareholders. To, right. Alice talked a little bit about this, but um, there's customers, there's suppliers, there's the world at large, there's your employees, extremely important so that you're building a culture, but that, to David's point about ownership, very important. I mean, if you can find companies where, this, where the board and the CEO have healthy ownership stakes, um, and I say healthy because sometimes if it gets too high, that basically it becomes a fiefdom for a, for a CEO or for a, a person who created the company. But if that share, if that person, and the uh, his, um, if that person's stake is such that it allows him to make healthy long-term decisions for the company and for all the stakeholders, that can be very healthy, and it certainly is a topic of um, of high of high uh, conversation among our members. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one final point on that, because uh, there's there is something to add into that. I think that might explain more that CEO number. Because coming in number two is the most important factor was good corporate governance. Yeah. So that is kind of a wrapper around mm -hmm. CEO compensation, I think, yep. and picks up some of the things that Andy was just talking about, yeah. I would in, think. In terms of what, what we view as good corporate governance uh, now, um, uh, what are the, beyond CEO pay, like what are the key factors in good corporate governance? Uh, well, I think Andy hit on one earlier when he talked about disclosure and accountability. I think that's a key factor in corporate governance. Um, I think Alice mentioned, you mentioned diversity um, on the board. Uh, I think um, that's another one that people care about. Uh, so I, I think there are a whole list of factors in the corporate mm -hmm. governance arena that uh, help maybe make the CEO compensation as a standalone less important, perhaps. It is interesting to talk about co corporate governance because historically, I think this is true, that Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company, scores very low on traditional corporate governance metrics. Um, yet, Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett is held up as a great, uh, one of the best companies uh, around, uh, one of the most fantastic leaders and investors that you can find. But his board um, is certainly stacked with people that he feels very comfortable with. He owns controlling most of the, he, stock in the company, largest shareholder. So it is interesting how to define that corporate governance because right. it does get very sticky when you start thinking about right. a lot of the details. Well, a track record like Buffett's can uh, sort of paper over a lot of corporate <laughs> yeah, governance absolutely. shortcomings. Yeah. I mean, he could have his uh, whole family on the board, and I don't know that anybody would necessarily care That's about the, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got lots of smart people on the panel, interesting poll results. I'm interested if folks in the audience have Questions about uh, any of the findings, uh, any of the things that we've talked about uh, so far. We've got a microphone back here. Uh, if you've got a question, you can raise your hand, or we'll just continue. There's one right there. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Um, in looking at the survey, I was struck by the lack of rebound in the confidence of auditors. Um, what I found interesting that w when we look at the results, the confidence in U.S. investing companies has rebounded from 2008 to 2013. It's actually significant, you know, it appears to be a good bit higher. Yet confidence in auditors, um, audited financial statements, I should say, um, has not rebounded. And so I'm curious as to what the panel thinks is the source of um, that problem. Even more curious is just the importance people place on those According to the study, the importance people place on audit statements to make financial decisions. Yeah, in, in particular, when you look at the number, it seems that, that that's declining over time. Yeah. You know, and, and it kind of, I'm an auditing professor, and so it struck me as a very curious result. Yeah, well, one thing I would point out, and it doesn't fully answer the question, but you didn't see as um, steep of a drop when uh, the financial crisis hit and other. 
you know, over the last seven years. So it's remained relatively steady compared to the other numbers. You saw much more variance, for instance, in confidence in the U.S. capital markets in general. Uh, there was a much bigger swing. So um, I think that it's held steady, but it did drop since 2007. Uh, when it was at a high at 80%, and now it's back down to 72. Although we had a drop and then it went back up. So I think it is slowly um, coming back up to the 80% level, but you're right, it's not um, up to where it was before. And why do we think that is? Uh, I mean, obviously there have been auditing, big auditing problems in the past. We haven't seen a lot of that uh, lately. There's obviously been much more consistency. Uh, why would that number drop, do you think? Uh, there's no way to... I don't know. I don't know. Happened. Given, like you said, the dichotomy when they ask who you trust the most, it's right. the independent auditors to look after their interests. So right. there's, that, the same there's a little bit of that tension. With the government, you know, we uh, trust the government's information, but we also think the government's about to kill us. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I guess there's, people can hold different ideas yeah. in their head. And it's time. unfortunate because it's, it's the, the, when, the, the, um, when the auditing, when something bad happens, that's when the auditors really <laughs> take it on the chin. Right. Um, uh, and there's been, various cases of that over just with the statements, restatements, that kind of thing. And, and so then that may be driving a lot of the people's um, lack of faith because they always expect it to be 100% rock steady. And so when it's not, it's hard probably for that number to move um, substantially higher, I guess. Yeah. Because it's just one of those things that it's like, I sh th and this to me is why the confidence in investing in U.S. markets is so much greater than the confidence investing in, in, in other markets. For me, most of it is because of the financial and for the audited um, the, uh, capabilities and the confidence I have in those statements here in the U.S. versus anywhere else in the world. Um, so when I see something not work out very well with an audited statement, well, my confidence may, not my confidence, but other, may just only move down, move down right. without coming back up. Well, the, as, a, as a, another factoid on that, though, Andy, the um, number of restatements has steadily declined year yeah. over year, and it's, it's at uh, the low, a low yeah. in the yeah. last 10 years. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's another good factor, which may, again, factor into why they have trust in auditors, but yeah. I, I can't explain that 70%. I just Although, love the fact that so many people are using auditors for right. financial yeah. statements. That, that actually surprised me. I think it was one in four... I think actually use financially. It was the most use. critical, right? And yeah. two thirds. Yeah, and two thirds rely, rely on them. them. Yeah, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. That that was very surprising. So but still, thank I think seventy-two percent yeah, confidence out of the financial right. statements. Yeah. Right, it's, it's still it's, a, a yeah. high number. Yep. Right. David, it seemed like you wanted to. Yeah, uh, I uh, in one of my finance classes, uh, I have groups of students. It's an advanced financial management class. Uh, choose a company that's in some financial difficulty, underperforming, underperforming its industry but not losing money and make some proposed changes based on what we've learned earlier in the semester. And I specifically specify to them that it has to be a US-based company, uh, not a company in another country because of differences in accounting standards and uh, reliability and, and so the US system uh, is something that we, I personally and people here in the room have a lot of faith and trust in and we, there's some ambiguities, uh, inconsistencies, different accounting standards in other countries. So I sort of implement that in my classes that I teach. Yep. Yeah. Um, other questions from uh, the audience? I think we have one here. Hi, Elise Perkins, Committee for Economic Development. And um, on your social media question, do you find that um, since the advent of social media that younger generations are becoming more confident investors? That's a good question. That is a very good question. Um, while you think about that, I will note that when we looked at the numbers of the 34% who use social media, uh, it definitely skewed younger. Um, mm -hmm. the, the younger people bumped that number up, so the younger you were, the more likely you were to rely on social media. Uh, to get your information. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't answer your question <laughs> as right. to whether or not um, um, that I, gives them more confidence. I can just tell you what I'm seeing from our, from our member base. Um, uh, there, uh, because younger um, people, uh, workers, necessarily don't have the money to invest outside perhaps maybe a 401k or a 403b, they tend 
not to be as interested in investing as we would have liked, as I would have liked, um, which I think is not surprising. That's natural. Most of our paying members tend to be uh, older in age, tend to skew male. Um, social media and all the positives that come with that, I don't necessarily think have driven necessarily, I at least have, don't think, it, I haven't seen it driven younger investor behavior, and we haven't necessarily seen it, I don't think, in our membership base. Mm. Um, but certainly, they, the information, those who are tweeting and using Facebook and any other social media, Pinterest and all those, um, certainly skew, or skew younger. Yeah, but, Allison, do you have a thought on that? But it is relevant because younger generations are, re are re in terms of social media be a, being a very powerful form of stakeholder engagement that's related to the value of the company. So it's relevant in terms of in information for investors. Uh, we have a question um, back there. Um, John Four with George Washington University. So the panel seem to agree that um, companies that have good corporate social responsibility programs and policies could be a good sign as being a good company and gave the reasons why. But how good are the metrics? in trying to make that link towards companies that have good reputation, CSR, and their actual performance. You're asking about the metrics for CSR? Uh, the metrics of linking CSR to company financial performance. So I think what you're asking, John, is that if you have um, uh, good social governance and good social responsibility, does that improve your results? Is there any linkage? So l let me say something about CSR and ESG and how we're using these terms. Um, an older, sc older school use of the term meant um, maybe strategic philanthropy and volunteerism that's on the side. And when I refer to ESG now, and I think the way we're referring to it here, is when it's fully integrated to a company's core strategy. So it means um, managing carbon emissions, use of uh, natural resources, um, mitigating risk and uh, reducing costs, and also looking to the long term uh, in terms of, as I mentioned earlier, maximizing opportunities and mitigating risk. Um, and actually, I hear companies talking more and more about, um, I was actually talking with um, the uh, a chief sustainability officer at Unilever, uh, who said, trying to, we're trying to think more in terms of opportunities than risks. And I know the, um, in, that investors are thinking, socially responsible investors, which actually account for $30 trillion, which is 20% of global capital um, markets of investment dollars, um, are, it used to be that they looked at uh, ESG in terms of r risk, you know, uh, in terms of a negative screen, and now they're looking at it more in terms of companies looking at opportunities. So I think that's an important distinction that ESG is now about integrating it into the core strategy. Um, in terms of metrics, um, the GRI standards uh, and SASB allows for greater measurement. In terms of tying it into companies' overall success, I think there are beginning to be some studies. I saw a reference to Harvard professors doing one, but I, perhaps others of you have seen other studies. I, I think there needs to be more related to that. Um, I've heard it refer, referred to as the ESG advantage. Um, and uh, I think this is the case that CEOs are making um, to in, in their investment presentations, and they're saying to me that uh, mainstream investors are becoming more and more interested in, in those conversations. Alice, maybe for some of us uh, who don't follow this stuff as closely, you could define some of those acronyms that we've been uh, using, ESG okay. and SASB. So, uh, SASB is, uh, is the uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Bureau. And GRI is the, I, I, know, I know it, but I wrote it down just to make sure that I uh, didn't get my acronyms wrong for you. Um, Global Reporting Initiative. 
and these are um, sustainability counting and reporting standards that um, actually GRI is in its fourth iteration and in its, in its most current iteration looks at materiality, which is particularly interesting because they make materiality part of the process um, at a company, um, which, which creates in the process a discussion of what's material in terms of ESG factors. Um, but it's really, um, it's really a maturation <clears throat> of, the reporting, um, of the reporting industry, which just shows how important it's become to companies and to investors um, to be able to track and report these issues. There's a third one too, the IIRC, That's that correct. also tracks it. That's the International Integrated Reporting Council. Correct. Um, so that's another group. If you're interested, you know, if you want to Google that too, it would give you some information. And it's, uh, there's, <clears throat> Alice mentioned maturation. There's also just um, a lot of disruption. For example, I don't know how many here are familiar with Glassdoor, which allows employees and former employees to rank their companies on a whole host of different scales. And then they bubble those up to a score for every company it allows you to look for jobs and understand the companies that you're going to apply to, but they rate the CEOs, how respected the CEO is, and, and um, bubbles it up to the various star ratings. So there's, there's a lot of innovation going on in understanding a company's, um, uh, those companies like I try to find, which are those that are mission driven, that are trying to live up to those stakeholders that, that I think the world need, cares about. And I think investors eventually um, will recognize as superior companies and superior investments. And those are companies that are sh serving customers, their suppliers, um, their employees, and also their shareholders as well, too. And, and understanding those companies that are mission-driven, companies like maybe Whole Foods or a container store or Starbucks, um, that, how that is reflected in some kind of measurement tool, I think, is still a debate to be had and still a, um, a big question mark out there, but we are definitely moving in that direction, which is exciting. All right. We have time for one more, yeah. I just wanted to follow up on that very point. Um, the sector of capital markets I work with is global, private, uh, publicly held real estate, and the lack of standardization of ESG measures has been very frustrating to issuers. Um, and um, I'm encouraged that you rattled off all these acronyms of organizations working to standardize measurements, but when there's already four of them, and um, that says something right there, and the underlying metrics for each ESG uh, factor is, of course, not standardized either nationally or globally, and I'm just curious if investors are concerned about this or if it's not an issue, and they're happy to read Glassdoor and um, operate under uh, out of uh, sub, you know this the relatively subjective uh, reporting uh, compared to say standardized accounting. Right. Yeah. How do p people pick and choose through all these various measures? Well, I'll just chime in very quickly that it, a is difficult to do, and I, I don't spend a lot of time um, focused on on the various um, uh, acronyms that Alice had, had talked about and those those ratings. Although I will say that I'm sure there are many very large mutual fund, hedge funds, Alice has mentioned how much SRI, how many investing dollars are going in there. So I'm not saying it's not important. Um, I think it's one data point, and I think it's like many data points, there are some positives to it, and it's a little bit flawed, but I think it's always getting better. And what I love to see are investors who care about these, because that's what's going to drive the improvement in the measuring and the transparency and all those metrics. So as long as there's that demand and that drive for more transparency and more information, that's good for investors. And we'll see that reflect in a lot of these measurements because there'll be resources spent to improving them. I don't want to leave anybody else out if there was more. I, Cindy, I wonder, um, we're, we're just about out of time, but if you could sort of bottom line for us where we are in terms of uh, investor confidence, both broadly in the markets, in the auditing profession, uh, and what we stand to lose if the government cannot figure out some way to raise the debt ceiling and, and reopen itself. Well, I think the bottom line is that investors are remarkably resilient and they do have a lot of confidence in our system. And to Andy's point earlier, 
they have a lot of confidence in the U.S. capital markets. And I think that's because we have the best capital markets out there. They're the most robust. Uh, they're the most regulated, and uh, they're probably the most transparent, and I think that adds to investor confidence. But I am really worried about those numbers, the plummet, uh, down to 39% confidence if we go into the debt ceiling uh, crisis, and that, that's just a remarkable number. That's actually even lower than the numbers are for markets outside the United States, and, and that, that, that's, I think, a damning statistic if, if we would come to pass. So. Um, I think this is an important data point for policymakers to consider, and, and um, you know, any of you that have uh, connections, I would urge you to share that statistic with them, because I think it really does bode very ill for our economy. Well, that's a depressing note to end it on, but uh, <laughs> definitely call, uh, call Speaker Boehner and call the President if you uh, have connections to them and share these numbers with them, because maybe that'll get them into a room and get this thing done. Uh, with that, I want to thank the panel, Andy, David, Alice, Cindy, for a great discussion, and thank you all for coming out. Thank you.